Okay, cool. Okay, so I'm gonna give it to maybe a 15 more seconds to make sure that people have had time to join. So you can move people, uh, Paritosh. I notice a lot of names. I recognize a lot of names here, but okay. Good. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So welcome to the Theoretical and Computational Biophysics Seminar Series. Today, we are honored to host uh, Dr. Pratyush Tiwari from the University of Maryland. <clears throat> Professor Tiwari uh, uh, is actually uh, from University of Maryland College Park, and he's jointly appointed in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry and the Institute of Physical Science and Technology at the university. So he's also affiliated with the chemical physics and biophysics programs at the, at the, at the university. By way of introduction, uh, he did his undergraduate degree in engineering at uh, IIT, Indian Institute of Technology in India. And then he completed his master's and PhD degrees in material science and Caltech. So he develops a very strong foundation in math and, and, and uh, physics. And then with this experience, he moves actually to two famous labs in our field. So first he does a postdoc at ETH Zurich, Technical University of Zurich with Mar Michel Parinello, Michele Parinello, 2013 to 2015 where he is involved in a variety of uh, uh, investigations, including you know, diffusive processes of all, all sorts, kinetics properties, rate calculations, metadynamics, different flavors of the methodology. And then he moves back to the United States, to Columbia, where he does another postdoc with Bruce Byrne, the famous lab there where he sort of starts to get attracted to our drug binding, unbinding studies, applying actually concepts uh, from all time to sort of uh, some biological systems, still looking at free energy landscapes and uh, looking for proper reaction coordinates to describe complex processes. That's actually a theme that he continued in his own lab in, 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 in Maryland where he is now trying actually to combine methods of artificial intelligence to molecular, with molecular dynamics to, for example, find out what would be the optimal pathway and reaction coordinate to describe a molecular system, which might be very complex and very difficult to study in the multidimensional space. So this theme of combining AI and MD is actually currently the main theme that uh, Pratyush follows actually, and uh, I believe that his talk today will also tell us a little bit uh, more about what he's doing. He is actually, he's a recipient of NSF Career Award, I should mention, and he's also a doctoral new investigator uh, uh, fellow from American Chemical Society Petroleum Research Fund in 2019, and also an emerging investigator award from several journals, including chemical physics, biochemistry, and molecular system design and engineering. Thank you very much, Pratyush, for being here with us today. And uh, we look forward to your seminar entitled, Can Artificial Intelligence Help Understand and Predict Molecular Dynamics? Okay, great. So thank you very much, Ahmad, for the very, very generous and kind uh, introduction. I mean, I would have loved to visit you all in person. And Next maybe time. I could have done it today, but today we just opened our semester here. And this morning, for yeah. first time in two years, I taught a live in-person class, Physical Chemistry 1, to 60 undergraduates. So I did not want to miss that. So, Absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, so at the University of Maryland, I'm in chemistry, biochemistry, and this institute, which I was just describing to Mad earlier, which has been at the forefront of statistical mechanics uh, over the decades, starting from Michael Fisher to Zwanze, Chris Jarzinski, John Weeks. And here I have been able to build my group uh, coming from students from various departments. So we have students from biophysics, physics, chemistry. We also have an applied mathematician in the group. And uh, somehow we get seem to get very, very good collaborators. 
couple of names you might recognize, Brinal Shekhar, who is an alumnus of uh, Imad's group. And I, I see Shashank in the audience. I should add his name here, but uh, somehow I forgot. And uh, and we also like to work with undergrads quite a lot. So, and uh, we, we, are, we are looking to hire more graduate students and postdocs if you're interested. So, and uh, these are the organizations which uh, fund our uh, research and we get super computer time wherever we can get hold of it. So with that acknowledgement, let's get to business. So the type of problems we are interested in can be broadly classified into two. They are interconnected, but let's look at them separately for just a moment. So the first problem we are very interested in is figuring out how do ligands dissociate from protein? So we are thinking about very flexible proteins, all atom simulations, all ions, everything is there. And we want to see, in this case, you're looking at the kinase, how does the ligand exit this? And you're looking at the drug, uh, I think it's uh, Glivec. Or, or something, yeah. So the reason why we are very interested in this is there are two reasons. The first reason was that uh, over the years, people started coming up with this picture that if you want to improve the survival probability in patients, instead of fine tuning the binding affinity of a drug, which is the thermodynamic stability of the complex, it's perhaps better to fine tune the kinetic stability of the complex. So this is the so-called pharmacokinetic picture. So this resonance time of the drug is a better predictor of how successful a drug would be. And of course, you can do surface plasmon resonance uh, experiments to get this resonance time, but simulations could be useful in telling you why is the resonance time what it is, what is, uh, what it is, and what should you do to the drug to improve the resonance time. So, and, and the second problem, so this is the first problem we are interested in. And the second problem we are interested in, like many of us in the audience today, is the problem of conformation change in proteins. So anytime you talk about protein conformations and AI, of course, the question is, didn't alpha fold already do it all? But the, uh, and uh, also more recently, there was a paper on science, uh, in science by Riju Das and uh, Ron Rohr group, even for RNA, I'm getting the structure for RNA. Uh, the thing about all these methods is they are really trying to get the ground state of the protein, right? And as we know, biology is not just about ground states, it's also about metastable states and excited states. So a model system that we work a lot with in my lab is this T4 lysozyme, where if you make one point mutation, this isoleucine, if you change it to an alanine, it opens up a hydrophobic pocket. And inside this hydrophobic pocket, many ligands can go and sit. Ligands that you would not think would normally bind, such as benzene, krypton, xenon, radon, all of these go and sit inside this hydrophobic pocket. The thing though is that in order to go inside, the ligand has, the protein had normally has a phenyl ring which blocks the entry to this pocket. Unless the phenyl ring is solvent exposed, the ligand cannot go inside. Now, if you make a second point mutation, the, the population of this excited state in which the phenyl ring is facing outside changes. One point mutation changes the population from 97 is to three to 66 is to 34. You make a third point mutation, the population completely flips. So the point I'm trying to make here is that for both of these problems, for example, for this sequence and this sequence, the ground state is one, but the excited states are different and their populations are different. And a lot of biology and not just drug design, but also fundamental understanding is really contingent on figuring out what are the excited states, what are their populations. And in this picture, I'm showing you one excited state. If you try to do a molecular dynamic simulation of the system, you will realize the excited states are just so many. There is a entropically many, different excited states that the system can take. They all capture their own relevance, their own story. And we would like to map out this landscape. And uh, so these are the two problems. And I say, I classified them as different problems, but you can see they are connected because in order for a ligand to go in, maybe you want the protein to be in a certain conformation state. And uh, yeah, so these are the two problems that inspire us. We want to solve them in generic systems. And to do that, we would like to play with molecular dynamics, which is to solve Newton's law of motion, classical Newton's law of motion with a femtosecond time step. If you do it on supercomputers, such as the one we have in uh, University of Maryland, you can get up to maybe a microsecond in a few weeks. With GPUs, maybe you can get up to 10 times faster. With Wall Street money, you can maybe get up to a millisecond. So when I was a PhD student, this is actually a slide I made in, I think 2009 for my qualifying exam at Caltech because I thought, wow, it's so cool that they are getting to millisecond. It's a wonderful slide because I really don't have to change it. Even, you know, I'm, I'm filing for tenure this year. I, I actually just filed and I don't have to change it because on Anton, on this very special computer, 
you are still we are still talking about milliseconds it's it's definitely become faster you can get to millisecond a bit quicker but anton has not changed the game the way you would have liked it to change it's not going to happen that just on anton you can get to study problems such as nucleation of a crystal or ligand unbinding which happens on way slower time scales and we don't want to just capture the fastest event at which it happens we want to capture the whole statistics which can be extremely extremely slow so Anton is wonderful, it will keep improving, but there is enough scope for doing methods that can be used on top of simple computing approaches. And there is a problem here. Of course, I mean, uh, 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 your group is at, 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 has been at the forefront of doing molecular dynamics on increasingly more complex system with as many atoms as one can imagine. Time scale is a bit trickier, right? Because we cannot just use parallelization to study this. In order to predict the future, we know we need to know the past exactly, right? And then physics, this is known as the butterfly effect. If you make a small system change in a dynamical system, it can have profound effects on the system's future. So we need to be careful in developing methods that can really access long time scales because brute force computing might not help us the way we want it to. And I want to make a point here is that this time scale thing that I showed you here is with classical normal force fields. If you go to polarizable force fields, okay, brood is a bit faster, but if you think about the amoeba force field, it is still way slower. If you want to do in the end, we perhaps we will 50 years from now, maybe we will all be looking at electrons all the time and not really ignore it as casually as we do currently, right? So if you want to do truly born Oppenheimer or Karpar in molecular dynamics, then we have even more time scale limitation. And perhaps one day we will start treating even the nuclear degrees of freedom in a quantum way. This, I, so as our description of nature becomes more and more sophisticated, the time scale problem will always become more and more pressing. So there is always a need for methods that can go and help us get to longer time scales. So the question, the theoretical question my group is trying to answer is, is this really true that in order to predict the future, we know, need to know the past exactly. So if you want to predict the future exactly, yes, you need to know the past also exactly. But if you're willing to make compromises in order to predict the future, for example, I'm trying to catch this thing in my hand. I can do this as I'm talking to you, right? I'm not trying to solve Miller's law of motion for every atom in the Avogadro number of atoms corresponding this, right? My brain is doing dimensionality reduction on the fly. It's telling me if you look at the center of mass and the torsion, maybe that is sufficient. So can we use these type of ideas to really speed up simulations? So in chemistry, these predictive degrees of freedom have a name. They are called reaction coordinate. If you know the reaction coordinate, the idea is it, it is the least you need to know the, about the system in order to be able to tell you everything about the system, right? And it can be quite useful. For example, if you project molecular dynamics on some free energy surface, normally it would be trapped in one basin and only a rare event would take it to the other side. There are lots of methods such as metadynamics, which Ahmad mentioned I was working during my first postdoc, where you start filling up the landscape and you go to the other side. Metadynamics is just one such method which allows you to explore back and forth. There are many, many, many other methods. Umbrella sampling is even older. There is adaptive bias and force. I would classify even Markov state model in this category. And the list of enhanced sampling methods is, it's, it's a cottage industry, which there is a new method every month. And when methods come out, often they come out with a claim that you can drive the sampling without knowing a priori, without having simulated the system, without knowing what is the reaction coordinate. You can still speed up the simulation, it will work. For metadynamics, Greg Voth, for example, has a very nice proof where he shows that for any reaction coordinate, this process will converge to the true free energy. Doesn't matter which reaction coordinate do you bias. In practice, good luck. If you are missing out on slow degrees of freedom, your metadynamics will show hysteresis. You will be trapped in one state. Similar problems apply to umbrella sampling. Umbrella sampling, it's actually more dangerous because you don't have a dynamical trajectory. You could do wham on your simulation and you could just think, oh, you got the right answer. It's all good. But uh, if you, unless you're careful, you will not realize that it's, it's quite wrong. So in practice, all of these methods work with any biasing variable in, in principle. In practice, you don't have to know the exact reaction coordinate and you'll get to a moment in a moment to what is an exact reaction coordinate, but it's best to be close to it. And in metadynamics, for example, the typical procedure and not just metadynamics, but all methods is to start with some approximation to the coordinate. You pick it in a, a typically an ad hoc manner, although people, uh, including a maths group, have been trying to come up with methods to improve this process 
you get your free energy. If you're still feeling brave, you can go and talk about the actual kinetics of how much time would it have taken to go back and forth. So one of the ways to get kinetics is something that I did as a postdoc using this idea of infrequent metadynamics, where the idea is if you know a good enough reaction coordinate, you don't bias the transition state. This idea comes directly out of uh, Helmut Grubmuller and Art Wouter's work, conformational threading and, infrequent and, and hyperdynamics. The key thing here is you should not bias the transition state. If you bias the transition state, you will start corrupting the dynamics. The good news though is you can do a p-value test and you can start to get signatures of how the dynamics is corrupted. And I wanna make a point that this method often gets criticized by people who don't use it carefully and then they go making noise that, oh, it's not working. But the method is actually quite self-consistent. It does not tell you how to find the reaction coordinate, but if you have a good reaction coordinate, you can get kinetics out of this procedure with a good trust associated with it. And we will look at that. We will use this in a moment. Uh, we will not, I will not go into the construction of the method, but I will be using it. So, but there's a big chicken versus egg problem at the heart of sampling. In order to do sampling, you have to know a good reaction coordinate how do you find a reaction coordinate if you haven't sampled the system to begin with? So my group has been basically looking at two classes of method, which first method is given limited sampling or given limited bias sampling, which is not to be trusted. How do you correct it to get a good approximation to the reaction coordinate? And the second is once you do have lots of sampling, how do you make sense of it, right? Because even if you do sample everything, you can easily get bombarded with terabytes or even petabytes of data. How do you make sense of it? So let's talk about this first class of method, which is how to make, how to predict this reaction coordinate. Before I go into it, I'm gonna show you why the problem is so hard. I like this picture quite a lot. It comes out of a paper by Gerhard Stock in Journal of Chemical Physics. And, uh, and this clearly shows why it's so hard. So let's look at it carefully. This is, it's, it's a six state system, okay, in two coordinates. And I'm showing you six basins. One, two, three, four, five, six. So in this two-dimensional projection, you can see that one is connected to two, four is connected to one, four is connected to five, four is not connected to two. Now let's make a 1D projection of this. The projection looks beautiful. You get all six clusters, but the projection is actually quite wrong, right? If you look at state four over here, it shows you that four has harder probability. It's less probable to go into one because the barrier is higher than to go into two because the barrier is lower, which is completely wrong. Four never directly goes into two, four always goes into one. And it completely misses out on the connection that four cannot go into, it shows you that four cannot go into five, but the reality is that four indeed does go into five. So I'm making a very simple point here that projections, this, this projection is completely correct in terms of free energy, but in terms of drawing any mechanistic information, it's completely misleading. And uh, if you want to uh, read more on this, I really recommend going and checking out Dan Zuckerman's blog. He has lots of nice details on this. So this is why the problem is so hard. And as we go into more remaining part of this talk, uh, the point I want to make is just doing principal component analysis or some other clustering method on your molecular dynamics trajectory. And then assuming that just because you are getting nice, clean, separated clusters, it's going to work as a reaction coordinate is a very dangerous thought. So how do we solve the problem? Well, there is one theoretical approach to it. It's called the committer, right? It was defined, it was introduced supposedly by Onsagar in 1939. If you go and read his paper though, he never uses the word committer, but I think the idea is there. And more recently it's been really revitalized by Eric Van den Eyden, also Divakar and Benoit Roux and many others. And there are methods to calculate it, but the idea in the committer is quite simple. If you have a two state system, remember it's only for two state picture really, you launch simulations from any point in space in configuration space, not phase space. You launch simulations with lots of randomized velocities in every, so you, you go to NAMD and put your seed to have value of minus one. So it generates lots of uh, random velocities and you count how many of them commit to A after a short time. So if it's closer to A, you would imagine 100% of them maybe commit to A. If it's closer to B, maybe 100% of them commit to B. And you join surfaces with the same commitment probability. Okay, so this is commitment surface with 100%, this is commitment surface 50%, and this is commitment surface with 0% to A, or maybe 10%. Then you draw a normal line through this, and this can be shown to be your perfect reaction coordinate in the sense that if you are moving along this line, if you knew your value, of the coordinate along this line, you would do a very good job of predicting what you're going to do next 
it's perfect. It, it's the best you can do in a one dimensional projection. However, calculating this is hard. As you can see, you have to launch lots of simulations. And for rare event systems, you have to go to the top of the barrier to launch lots of simulations, which is like saying, uh, I'm going to go from, uh, I don't know, from uh, uh, India to Tibet, and I'm going to climb to the top of Mount Everest to launch my simulation. That's going to be very, very hard, right? And this is for a two-state picture. If you have multiple states, or especially if you have little metastable states lying in the middle, this becomes a very tricky calculation. So we need more practical approximate definitions for this. I do want to point out with my mathematician student, we have been working on very actually efficient ways to calculate even the commuter very accurately in multiple state systems. This is a preprint using diffusion maps and something called Mahanadovis kernel, which just came out, but I'm not going to talk about this method. I'm going to try to stay very practical and think about rare event systems. So for rare event systems, we take inspiration from work by Bill Bialik, who is a biophysicist at Princeton, who some of you might know about. And Bialik himself, his work on information bottleneck, I think is, is a, in some ways a restatement of Shannon's the famous Shannon's work on rate disruption theory, but let's talk, we will, we will talk in the context of information bottleneck. So information bottleneck says that if you want to come up with a model of a system, it should have two properties. So what do I mean by model of a system? Let's say you have input, which is the temperature of all cities in the United States today, okay? Let's say you have 100 cities, 100 big cities in the United States and you know all that temperature. And you want to come up with a model which given all this information tells you the temperature of all of these hundred cities tomorrow, right? So this could be a model that you want to come up with. So the model would be chi and you want to come up with this chi that can tell you the temperature of every city tomorrow. Or you could take the temperature of all cities today and you want to come up with the temperature of Arvana Champagne tomorrow, right? You want, you have a high emission input and the output can be high emission or low emission. What information bottleneck says is that any generic model should have two properties. First of all, it should be very predictive, right? If your model is not able to do a good job of prediction, then what good is that model, right? It's maybe like homeopathy, you don't, it has no predictive power. At the same time, the model should be as compressive as possible. So the compressive thing is a bit more abstract to understand. The reason why you want the model to be compressive is because otherwise it will just try to if you make this model very complicated, it can just try to commit the input information to memory. It will not be learning predictive features. It will just be learning everything. It will be learning the noise in the data. So you, you reach, a, you, so this leads to a structure which looks like two funnels facing opposite directions. At one, the first funnel, you want to compress the input as much as possible. The other funnel, you want to predict the output as well as possible. In our case, in molecular dynamics, this input is the trajectory of a system. And this could be the all item coordinates, or it could be, for example, uh, MR students Nandan and Archit and uh, Sefer showed me how they had distances going into a system. So the input could be some five or six distances that you have, and the output could be the same distances slightly into the future, okay? So a good model should compress as much as possible while still predict as much as possible. And you can write this down mathematically as the difference of two mutual informations. So you can see a minus sign over here. You compress the input by minimizing this mutual information while you maximize the prediction by maximizing this mutual information due to the minus sign, it, comp uh, uh, it makes it negative. And uh, so in this, this, in principle, this does the problem. And you can see how it is related to that notion of a committer. Right, you are trying to come up with a degree of freedom here that is as predictive of what you're going to do next. So it's in a certain way, it's a generalization of a committer. So, and to minimize this objective function, you have to use something called variation inference. Those of you who like StatMech, it's basically a restatement of Feynman gibbs Bogolyubov inequality. You can read about it even in David Chandler's book. That's how we solve the Ising model. I'm not gonna go get into that. So I'm gonna show you a bit more intuition as to why this information bottleneck so specifically, we are talking about a past future information bottleneck. What is the minimum you need to know about the system's past in order to predict its future accurately? So if you look at this alanine dipeptide system, uh, uh, we can see here that uh, if, if you look at the information bottleneck, it has the nice properties that you expect of a committer, which is, which is called this commitment, uh, commitment probability plot. It gives you a nice peak. And in this paper where we show that you don't want to predict just 
the uh, all coordinates of the system, but what we do here is to predict the state of the system. So a priori, we don't know which state the system is in. So let's say it's alanine dipeptide. If you have studied this system and some many of you must have, you know it's really three states. And two of these states can be coalesced into one if your time resolution is too long. So it boils down to two state or three state depending on how far into the future you're looking. And that's what we get over here. A priori, we don't know how many states are there. So we start with 10 states. If you look slightly into the future, the algorithm converges to three states. And if you look too far into the future, it converges into two states. So you can think of this. So it's not like a Markov state model where you have to go to very long time scales to converge the method. Here, how far into the future you are predicting is a control parameter, which decides the resolution that you're looking, taking to look at the system. So if you want to capture the finer events, you look small, shortly into the future. If you want to capture slower events, you look further into the future. Now, if you want to use this information bottleneck as an approximation to the reaction coordinate in bias simulations, you would probably look a bit later into the future so that you speed up the slow degrees of freedom. If you don't look later into the future, you would be speeding up the fast degrees of freedom. So, and this allows me to present the algorithm to you. So we have, in this case, this is a ribo switch and a small ligand is bound here. If you do MD simulation this, not much will happen. If you do a bias simulation, maybe it will dissociate, but maybe you don't trust that dissociation process. So you take this trajectory and you learn the information bottleneck. In the first uh, avatar of the paper, we used this encoder, which is how you go from the input features to the bottleneck. And this, we were inspired by TICA method, for example, so we kept as a linear encoder because then it's easy to read off which input feature plays a weight in the reaction coordinate. And uh, we train and now in newer versions, we have a, a nonlinear encoder also, but then the interpretability of this reaction coordinate is an open problem we are working on. So we take this bottleneck as a proxy to the reaction coordinate. Why can we do that? Because I showed you that it has the properties of the committer. And we run bias simulation now using this reaction coordinate. And now our ligand, for example, dissociates or the protein undergoes transformation change. We don't quite publish yet. We take this trajectory, we train another round of bottleneck and we keep iterating a few rounds until the reaction coordinate converges. So you can read about this paper, uh, this method in this paper and also in the review that we wrote in Current Opinions, which also talks about other similar methods. So, and uh, before I go into applications, I want to show you that often since you're fitting deep neural networks, the reason it all works is because you have so many parameters, right? And neural network is just, uh, some of you might recover, uh, remember that quote from Wigner that with one parameter, I can draw you an elephant. With two parameter, I can wiggle its trunk. With three parameters, I don't know, I can make the elephant do tango or something. A neural network has millions of parameters, right? So it's very easy to overfit. And it's very easy to get to wrong solutions. So I'm quite proud of this work, which actually a math student, Shashank, visited me in my lab and we had a great summer. And I'm not gonna go into the construction of this, but the key idea here was that if you are getting many possible answers for your reaction coordinates from this framework, you look at the time scale separation along every reaction coordinate. And in order to get this time scale separation, you use something called maximum caliber method, which is like a maximum path entropy method popularized by Kendall. And you can see that you can rank solutions. So if, if you train your neural network to very low loss values, the spectral gap or the time scale separation is very high. But if you don't know when to stop, you can have a scatter in the spectral gap. So, and you don't know which one to trust here, you can look at the spectral gap and use it as a way to build some confidence into your neural network solution. And uh, Shashank uh, showed this nicely on some model systems. And this work in fact was featured on the cover of Journal of Chemical Physics. So that's, uh, that's how I got my Taj Korshid index to be one, which I'm quite proud of. <laughs> but I'm not gonna talk about this methods. I want to show you one more method and then get into applications. So, so far, I have showed you how to speed up simulations. And before I get into this method, let me just remind you, the idea here is to take a trajectory, learn a bottleneck, use this bottleneck as a reaction coordinate to do enhanced sampling, 
use this enhanced sampling trajectory with weights of the data. So it's quite important that you're able to reweight the data. There are many enhanced sampling methods where you cannot reweight the simulation. For example, Gaussian accelerated MD where the weights can just blow up. And that's an issue. We don't want to use that. We want to use methods where weights can be trusted. If you take these weights and the keep iterating, and gradually you will find that the, uh, the things converge. But once you have done everything, how do you make sense of the simulation? You have a long trajectory coming out of molecular dynamics. This could be out of enhanced sampling. This could be out of a simulation done on Anton, or this could be out of experiments. How do you make sense of this? So this work actually, uh, I should acknowledge that, <laughs> So I have I actually quite a few math connections. So Carlos, who is currently a math student, visited my group and uh, he was a summer intern and that's when he kicked off some of this. And of course we went off in other directions after that, but this is when we started doing this. So the idea here was to use something from machine learning called long short-term memory networks. These are a bit more complicated than the encoder decoder structure that I showed you. However, these are used heavily and I'm ready to bet with like a thousand dollar bet that during the course of the last 28 minutes that I have been speaking, at least 10 of you have made use of this AI architecture because of you are probably trying to multitask and write an email as you listen to me, which all of us do. And Google uses this technology in their smart compose. So the idea here is, so let's look at this GIF over here where it is suggesting you what to write next, okay? So it says, let's get together soon for tacos. I find that impressive because now it says tacos and how did it predict that? In order to say tacos, the last time you mentioned tacos was in the subject, right? So think about the memory it had to carry. For you, it's obvious. Oh yeah, you mentioned taco in the subject, so you do it here. But think about a machine, think about a computer. This is one letter, two letter, three letter, four letter, five letter. It's maybe a hundred letters back that you mentioned taco. Right? So think about the number of words that you might have had in this space. If every letter can be 26 options, if you write in Chinese, then maybe 200 options in Hindi, in my language, 60 options. You're thinking about 60 to the power 100 combinations. How does it remember all that? So our inspiration was that maybe it's fitting something like a generalized Longevin equation, which is learning how to take, tackle the memory in a very smart way. And this long short term memory network has exploded in the space of natural language processing. Now it has all, all, uh, also been superseded by something called transformer networks and the field of AI is something it's very hard to keep up with. So our inspiration was that, could we take a molecular dynamics trajectory where instead of letters, think about the dihedral, for example, right? Could you map the dihedral into an abstract language of letters and then use natural language processing to predict what's going to happen next. So this long short term memory network, as I mentioned, it's a bit more complicated, What it really is a recurrent neural network. It takes the output of a network and it feeds it back. And that's how it works very, very well. And in this paper, what we showed, which was quite interesting, is that actually it is learning something like the path entropy of a system, the same caliber that I briefly mentioned earlier. And I'm not gonna go into this, I will show you what it does for us in practice. So here is a riboswitch pulling experimental trajectory uh, out of Michael uh, Woodside's lab in Canada, where he, he, he has an experimental trajectory. You can see the three states, two with low population, and you can get a time series of the raw data. This is highly non-Markovian trajectory, right? Because if you are at this point over here, which state are you coming from? You have no idea. You have to really look at this, how you got there in order to predict what it's going to do next. So we can train our LSTM and we can make trajectories that you cannot distinguish from how they look, how they look from the raw data. They look almost identical. So now we can make trajectories which look just like the experiment at no cost. We don't even have to run the experiment again. Furthermore, we can analyze this to get the kinetics for moving between these states. The competing model here is hidden Markov model, and we can do far better than hidden Markov models. So this was the first paper. We are trying to build it up in new ways. We are also trying to enforce here, for example, what if you did not trust this part of the raw data? What if you, your experimental, your apparatus was corrupted over here and you don't trust it? You know that whenever it goes to this much extension, these the instrument cannot be trusted. However, you have some molecular dynamic simulation for that part, and you want to combine it with MD and to come up with a time series that makes the best of MD and experiments. Since we have this path entropy interpretation of the long short term memory network, we can do that. And that's work in progress. So stay tuned. I'm going to show you some applications of the RAVE method now. 
And uh, I will show you two applications. So the first one is dissociation of ligands from this pre-Q1 riboswitch. So, um, I mean, uh, my collaborator at and National Cancer Institute, which is just half an hour from here, Jay Schneeklock, he's very interested in designing ligands that bind to it. And uh, in, in the PDB, in the protein data bank, there are at least 200,000 structures, if not more, of synthetic ligands bound to protein. For RNA, the number is much smaller, maybe 100, maybe something like that. It's a really, really small number. And part of the reason is because RNAs are so flexible. So he was able to make this ligand, which goes and binds to this RNA with a slightly weaker binding affinity. So the question he asked us was, what, why is the affinity weaker and what can we do to improve it? And what's, what's really going on? So the first thing we did was to do unbiased MD simulation on this. We used this nice force field by D-Shaw. So this is explicit atom, by the way, uh, I think tip 3 p I forget which water is there. So we do four independent simulations of 500 nanosecond each. So the system never dissociates, of course, because it's too short for dissociation to happen. But one thing which was quite interesting is, my collaborators had done these shape experiments and don't ask me what exactly these shape experiments are. I'm, I'm, I got into theory for a certain reason. <laughs> so, but in a, in a nutshell, they can measure the flexibility, nucleotide site dependent flexibility. So there is no fitting over here, but what I'm showing you here is for the APO system where there is no ligand and for the ligand bound system with the cognate ligand and the synthetic ligand, we get exactly the same flexibility profile that they were getting in the experiment. This was really exciting because this tell, shows us that the force fields have really come off, starting to come off age for RNA, right? That the same part of the RNA has had the same flexibility. I think this is quite interesting that we can get such agreement, which gives us confidence in using it to make further predictions. So now we do rave simulations on this. And we find that the cognate ligand and the synthetic ligand both tend to dissociate through two pathways, two sets of pathways, you can call them. So the cognate, there is a top pathway and there is a bottom pathway, okay? And both systems can take both pathways. However, for the cognate ligand, which is found in nature, the top pathway dominates. For the synthetic ligand, the bottom pathway dominates. Again, I want to emphasize it's dominate. So maybe it's 80 is to 20 ratio for 80% top pathway and here 80% bottom pathway. This shows us that if you go and make a mutation in the top, it's more likely to have an effect of the dissociation of the cognate ligand. A mutation on the bottom will not have that much of an effect. And for the synthetic ligand, we should see a reverse trend. If you make a mutation in the bottom, it should have a stronger effect. Mutation on the top should not have that strong of an effect or weaker effect than this one. And keep in mind, these are not obvious mutations. You could not have predicted them just by looking at the structure. Kinetics matters for these one. These are mutations that play a role. Uh, these are distal mutations. These are not purely structure-driven mutations. In fact, if you looked at the shape profile, these you maybe had a sense there, but not really. So we made these predictions. We did our in silico simulations. So we did, we biased, we created the mutated system and we biased it and we looked at the dissociation and we found this to be true, which gave us confidence to tell our collaborators to go and do the experiments. And they did this KD measurement and they found that if you look at the, uh, the cognate ligand, the cognate ligand is also known as pre-Q1 ligand you can see that the point mutation on the top, U22A, KD becomes much worse than the A32U mutation, okay? But for the synthetic ligand, if you make the A32U mutation, it just doesn't bind. It becomes really bad, but for the U22A mutation, it still binds, but much weaker. So our predictions were in fact validated, which was quite exciting. So here, we, and this is what we are writing up here, so we did not make predictions about how to change the ligand, which is something we're looking at, but we had the confidence to go and make predictions about the mutations, which our collaborators would have never predicted. And uh, another application is in uh, protein kinases. Uh, this is with Minal Shekhar, uh, I mean, uh, Imad's <laughs> alumnus, who is now at Broad Institute. So here we are looking at protein kinase, and this drug is called Glivec. So Glivec is one of those drugs that you know, made it to the cover of Time magazine. I think the only drug which has so far made it to the cover is Viagra, apart from Glivec. Viagra has also been there. Maybe we see some other drugs this year. So when Glivec came out in 2001, it was called wonder drug of the century, right? Because for certain forms of leukemia, people's, it was just miraculous. But many years later, same drug, 
in the context of other drugs was featured in Newsweek because many of these people were developing mutations and the drug would fail. Even more interestingly, Gleevec would work against ABLE. It would not work against SARC. Benoit Roux has been looking at it for decades, more than decades since I was in high school, maybe, as to trying to understand better and better as to why this happens. I would like to say it's still an open problem. We don't really understand what goes on here. It's, it's complex. Benoit might disagree. I think it's complex too. So in this case, we are not trying to answer the question of ABLE versus SARC. But what my collaborator, Marcus Seeliger at Stony Brook did was to make a point mutation N387. He changed it to an S and he found that if you make this mutation, the binding affinity for Gleevec stays kind of same, but the kinetics, the KF, the residence time changes by four times or three times. And he wanted us to explain why it's that going on. So let's start with this plot on the bottom right. You can see here that experimental, the blue line, the residence time changes by three times. So we learned our reaction coordinate for this system on the fly as a combination of different protein ligand contacts. So in this case, we learned the reaction coordinate as a combination of maybe a thousand different contacts that you can find between the protein and the ligand. And we, by doing this infrequent metadynamic simulations along this reaction coordinate, we can get a very good p-value. We can show that the reaction coordinate is trustable. And we can reproduce the residence time that Marcus found in experiments. We indeed see that the mutant, the ligand, uh, the Gleevec has a much shorter residence time. What is even more interesting, we can explain why that is the case. So if you look for the wild type, uh, by the way, this paper just got rejected from PNAS on Friday because the reviewer, believe it or not, said that the agreement with experiment is too good. So, so I'm still a bit upset about this. But anyway, I, I, we will submit it somewhere else. But in this case, we found that the ligand for the wild type has to go through this hinge region of the kinase. So the kinases are wonderful because these, these regions are really preserved across different kinases. These are evolutionary preserved. So in this case, the hinge region is very bulky and the ligand has to open a big door for it to exit. Once you make this N387S mutation, it makes the activation loop very flexible. And Divakar has studied a lot on this activation loop so he can tell me more about this. When this becomes flexible, it allows this alpha helix also to move. So this part of the protein becomes so flexible. So it's like having a backdoor pathway, right? It's like, for those of you who remember uh, when we used to attend in-person seminars and you remember when at the end, this point of the seminar, you are really anxious to go and enjoy the last cookie that is remaining in the seminar room. However, there is a problem. There are two pathways. One is to go in front of the speaker through the main door and that's really problematic, right? It's hard to do. But what if you have a backdoor pathway, then you can quickly exit, get the cookies, right? So think of it as that backdoor pathway. And this backdoor pathway gets activated in the mutated system. And that's why it is much faster. And we can make, we can really show this is going on. So, and then we have some other system. We can go and learn the reaction coordinate for ligand flexibility in this work, which we published in Journal of Physical Chemistry B. And we can converge the free energy difference between these uh, with very high accuracy relative to experiments. As you can see, the free energy difference between the three mutants, we get in good agreement with experiments in, in a relatively limited simulation time, much, much faster than unbiased MD, of course. And uh, I think, uh, so I think I'm gonna go to the question and answer session. I just want to highlight one. Uh, we, we are a statistical mechanics group. We like to integrate statistical mechanics and AI with molecular dynamic simulations and develop methods. We are also working on problems where there is simply no hope for a reaction coordinate. And that's where you use replica exchange simulations. The problem in replica exchange is if your system is big, it's, it's a, a million atom system, then you can't do replica exchange on all million atoms, right? Because the acceptance probability for moves goes down to very small. So in this method, which uses a certain different flavor of AI called denoising diffusion probabilistic models, where the idea is how do you learn to change no data into noise, sample information from noise, and then change back noise into data. So we use this model to show how we can improve upon replica exchange in purely post-processing. And I'm really flashing through this and sample conformations of the system, which were never sampled at low temperature and uh, uh, get these very uh, accurately. So here you don't have to rerun your replica exchange. You have your replica exchange where the acceptance probability was very weak. 
and yet you can go and sam generate samples at the lowest temperature, which are which you never even visited. And there are competing methods to do this. For example, Ron Levy has a method called temperature WAM. The problem there is you have to do exponentials of energies. In our method, you don't have to do exponentials of energies, and it's been less. So I'm going to skip this method. If we, if if there are no question answers, maybe I can go back to it later. But otherwise, I think in the interest of question answer, I just want to conclude now. So the picture in today's talk was that using AI, this difference difference between learning and predicting. So by learning, I mean long short term memory network. They are very powerful. You can take a time series and you can learn what the time series is doing. It's very easy to fit those. It's so powerful. Predicting molecular dynamics is a bit harder because you have to come to terms with getting the com committer. Predicting is also harder because we don't want to apply it on systems which are already well sampled on Anton. We want to do it for rare event systems where one microsecond is nothing or even one millisecond is nothing. So we are not working in the domain where AI is traditionally designed to work. AI is designed to work in domains where there is no shortage of training data. In molecular dynamics type of systems we are interested in, there is a shortage of training data. Most of the data is just the same data set repeating again and again and again. So here coupling AI with StatMech is really the way to approach. And I showed you some applications. Basically I showed you a ligand protein dissociation application, which was with able kinase. And I showed you a ligand nucleic acid uh, application. My lab is really, we are not trying to accelerate molecular dynamics just for ligand dissociation. We have a huge interest in a range of problems. We are also looking at problems very different from what you would consider traditional biophysics, such as crystal nucleation. And there also we are trying to speed up the process. In my group, I have tried to hide programmers who are way better at programming than me. The advantage is our codes are easy to use. You can go and try them out at GitHub. They are all available with nice tutorials. And I think it's an exciting time to be a student who is well-versed in biophysics or chemical physics and also artificial intelligence. You can develop nice methods. You can really see how the fields are evolving. And it's also good for job prospects because you're learning things from so many fields. And uh, we, we have been lucky enough to get a new R35 grant from NIH. So now we have to hire more graduate students and postdocs. So if you have interest, please let me know. With that, once again, thanks to Ahmad for the invitation and I'm happy for questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Pratish. This was one of the most vibrant and rich seminars I have listened to in a year, actually. It's a very, very nice talk. Thank you so much for exposing us to, to all these uh, frontiers and what can be done really, this is amazing, amazing. So I can, I can start with, the, with one question again. I mean, when you look at, for example, the ligand binding, unbinding uh, in your RNA case or, uh, or, the, uh, uh, or the other protein that you had, so is it trivial to sort of kind of uh, map what you observe in your simulation and you motivate and accelerate with the right reaction coordinate, is it trivial to map it to some physical kind of pathway that is understandable <clears throat> by medicinal chemists or by yeah. chemists or something like that? Or is it complicated? It's complicated. So here we have linear model. So a linear model tends to be easier to understand. But now my group is really moving towards non-linear models and there oh. it becomes harder and harder. And there how to interpret an yeah. AI model. It's, it's, it's an open question. There are ways to do it systematically. We are working on that. But you're absolutely correct. Like for instance, in this case, Mrinal knew about the kinases that what medicinal chemists would like to look at is does it get close to the hinge region or not? Yeah. He knew what to look for. So the problem with AI is it won't give you intuition. What AI can do is to rank different intuitions. It I might see. sound abstract, but hopefully my point is clear. So if you have 50 possible answers, it will tell you trust this one more than the other one but it won't come up on things on its own. So two years ago, there was a physical review letter paper which went viral where they said, AI predicts that the world is heliocentric. And I was like, wow, this AI is amazing. <laughs> but if you look at this, as happens in most PRLs, if you look at the supplementary information, you will realize, no, it is, one of the models given to the AI was a heliocentric model. There were other models also. I see. And it showed that the heliocentric model correlates best with what you observed. I see. So and that really is the problem here. In order to get intuition out of AI, you are doing correlations. Mm -hmm. Does that mean correlation is causation? We know it's not true, right? So we have no. to be careful. I see. I see. Very, very. I, I really liked actually 
pranking the intuitions uh, kind of phrase that you use. That's really. So if you guys have any questions, we can raise your hand or you can even turn on your camera and microphone and Nanda, yeah. go ahead. So uh, it's first of all, very nice talk. And uh, I have a question about that. So you showed some trajectory in uh, one of your slides. I forgot which slides, but uh, are those trajectories? So yeah, for example, here, I think. So are those trajectories, is it contains the dynamic information or it's like, is this a like, what is the time scale of this trajectory? Yeah, so in this case, we were not trying to get kinetics. These were, we did not do, we did not. So for the kinase problem, I did not show trajectories. There, the trajectories do have dynamical information because we really put a lot of effort into cleaning up the reaction coordinate. So you can rescale the dynamics using the acceleration factor and rescale the clock. In this case, it was hard for us. We did not try to do kinetics here. So the the so when I show you this this plot and maybe that's what you were going to ask me next that this mutation matter for this mutation does not matter. There is actually a bit more nuance into predicting which mutation matters because as as you correctly pointed out, if there is no mechanistic information in this trajectory, we cannot make these predictions, right? So in order to do this, we actually do a detailed analysis of the trajectories and derive mechanistic information indirectly. I did not go into that. Once the paper comes on bioarchive, you can see that. But uh, you can get you can get dynamical information if you go and check whether the p-value is correct or not. We have ways of doing that. We did not do it here. We did do it for the kinase. I see. So so then uh, my next question would be like uh, related to this is that if you do predict that uh, get the dynamic information, what is the time scale typically you get? So you can see it here for the kinase. It's on the order of uh, hours. It's really really slow. For the riboswitch, we did not try to do it. I think the riboswitch dissociation is even slower, but for the kinase, we are getting this. And this is system dependent, right? And you could even look at it from the trajectory. When we started doing the wild type simulation, it was obvious because in order to get dissociation, we were filling up maybe 500 GB of data. For the mutant, we would get dissociation in 10 GB of data. It was so much faster. I see. I see. Okay. So, and you can, we have model systems such as these ligand fragments where you get dissociation in microseconds. Yeah. Well, it's really system dependent because we don't know the answer a priori, right? Tell us. Ken. Insightful talk, writers. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. uh, just a general kind of future type of question. Do you think we will learn about more about uh, general strategy that evolution converges on for dissociation based on your great studies with discovering new reaction coordinates? Yeah, that's, that's so, I mean, here we can predict which mutations would have an effect, okay? Now, whether these mutations would have showed up in evolution, I think that's another question. So there you have to make a free energy landscape in sequence space, right? And I think Robert Best makes such landscapes like this and you know, other people also. That's something I'm looking for collaborations if we can look at that together, you know, but we can't say that. But so all we are saying, for example, let's look at this N387S mutation. We are showing that if this mutation happens, it would have an effect whether this mutation could have effect. So Marcus calls these as a, kinetic, a mutation which leads to kinetic resistance. Whether this mutation could have happened just on the basis of evolution, that's another question. And I don't think my lab is equipped to answer that. No, it's great. So Pratisha, so uh, oftentimes when we accelerate processes using simple minded reaction coordinates, so to say, we have, we run into two problems. One is uh, we are accused that we don't know what's gonna happen at long time scales regarding force field and things of that sort. And the other problem is that uh, there are many other degrees of freedom of the, pro of the system that don't catch up. Like, you know, we have a protein in a lipid bilayer, we accelerate the protein motion, but the lipids are still sluggish and slow. Did you, did you uh, have you, do you have any thoughts on, on this aspect? on the sort of orthogonal degrees of freedom that we are leaving behind? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's, I can show you my backup slide. So what we try to do here is the dictionary that we put into these methods to learn the reaction coordinate is typically not just protein ligand distances, but we also consider pocket reorganization. So this ability to capture pocket reorganization is always there. If you find in the next round, and remember we iterate our bias simulation, right? Mm -hmm. So two things can happen. Either, the, either there is never any conformational change, if that doesn't happen, 
then it does not matter or maybe you, in your pathway it does not matter and if there is some pocket reorganization then in the next round of simulation the weight of this pocket reorganization will start to play a role in the reaction coordinate nice. and i want to make another point i have we have a sort of collaboration with alex mackerel which is exactly in this spirit because as he improves his brute force field he has the same question now if enhanced sampling was to be really trusted, it would be wonderful yeah. news for force field developers. Yeah. And that's what uh, Imad, uh, that's what, uh, sorry, um, uh, yeah. Alex is looking at to yeah. use our ray method to quickly say whether this parameterization can be trusted or not. Nice. So, we're trying, so in the end, I think force field developers and enhanced sampling have to go hand in hand. Yeah, no, no, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Okay, so any other questions? Uh, Taras, your hand's still raised. Do you have another question or is it just from the last one? <laughs> okay. I just like to hold my hand up. Okay. Hian, do you have a question? You turn on your yeah. camera. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I did turn on that thing. Um, first of all, I really enjoyed your talk. Like for my last presentation, I mentioned your name multiple times. How much I like your work? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, for your uh i have a question regarding the diffusion model you showed but didn't go too much into detail so uh and um so as far as i'm concerned in the normal like a diffusion model that involves the image and audio as the input and trying to i don't know recover some generate uh the sample the generative model blah 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 those kind of things and i think uh, the goal of the model uh training was to learn the uh error estimation model so that from the uh, error image you're going to be able to recover the original image. So um, in, I mean, in your like research, like uh, what uh, the UNET model that you're using, is that what it is doing the learning, the, um, I should say the error, like what, like how is it exactly uh, working? Uh, First of all, I can really tell that you have looked up the preprints, which is very good. <laughs> no, this is very exciting work. And uh, to be very honest, both Shashank and Brinal are most excited about this paper. So they have been bothering me if they can try it out on some system and actually we might do that. So it's a bit different from what you have seen in those papers. What we are, the big picture here is, think about temperature of a system. How do we get temperature out of molecular dynamics? We get the temperature by looking at the kinetic energy, right? We say that, so when you do, when you simulate a replica at 400 Kelvin, it is a replica at 400 Kelvin. There is a well-defined defined, well -defined unique temperature but there is a fluctuation in the kinetic energy. So in replica exchange, you use this fluctuation to exchange simulations with each other. But there is more that can happen. The idea here is that if you look at this replica blue and if you replicate this replica green, think about them, they are actually sampling the same thing to some limit. So can this information be mixed together to come up with a better model? So we think of, so we are not really doing modeling in the x comma t space we are doing modeling in the x comma kinetic energy space and what we are showing here is that replica exchange the way we do it is not getting the best out of the information you have there is more information that is out there and the error bars we can calculate on top of that so uh, have you seen my students actually made a nice uh, demo code on this have you tried that uh, no, I actually just found out. <laughs> yeah, you should try that. It will give you more intuition. And if you have more questions, I'm happy to talk more. Sure. All right. Thank you. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Last call. If not, thank you very much, Pratyush, for the stimulating discussion and the seminar. I think we all enjoyed it very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. So, so for the next meeting, which room do I go to? Which Zoom uh, room? So let me see. I think actually, why not just stay here? Yeah, why okay. don't you just stay here? We make sure that people leave. Easiest. Ivakar, I see. Well, if people want to stick around, uh, you know. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think we. So okay. It's good to have a little private. Yeah. Meeting, I guess. Well, I mean, the only reason I didn't ask questions because I figure I have half an hour to ask questions. So, 